The world's next gold rush isn't on land. It's happening three miles beneath the Pacific, where sunlight dies, pressure crushes steel, and the ocean floor hides metals worth trillions. It started when a prehistoric shark lost a tooth. Over time, a few millimeters every million years or so, minerals formed around it and other bits of debris, until they became potato-sized rocks. There are trillions of these nodules, that's what they're called, just waiting to be picked up. The problem is, they're on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. But the process used to collect them is controversial. Mining companies have been testing technologies to essentially suck up and retrieve these nodules and claim the environmental risks are limited. Down there, on a stretch of seabed between Hawaii and Mexico, lies the clarion Clipperton Zone, an area larger than the continental United States, carpeted with metallic nodules rich in nickel, cobalt, manganese, and rare earths, the same materials that power electric cars, smartphones, and satellites. For decades, this was untouched territory, international waters, legally the common heritage of mankind. Then, quietly, it was divided. Today, only about 20 entities hold exploration licenses from the International Seabed Authority, the UN-affiliated body that governs the deep. Many of those licenses are controlled not by governments, but by private corporations, billionaire-funded shell companies, and state-linked fronts. They've mapped the ocean floor with robotic submersibles, built prototypes to vacuum minerals from the abyss, and secured concessions that make entire nations look small. And while the world debates the ethics of mining Mars, these people are already buying the sea. This is the story of how the richest players on Earth moved past borders, laws, and continents, and began claiming the last unknown place on the planet. In the 21st century, the race for oil was replaced by something cleaner, at least on paper. Cobalt, nickel, manganese, and rare earth elements became the new lifeblood of modern civilization. Each electric vehicle requires six times more mineral input than a gas-powered car. Each wind turbine blade, solar panel, and smartphone draws from the same finite supply. By 2030, global demand for battery metals is expected to triple. But there's a problem. Almost all of it comes from unstable ground. Cobalt from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where child labor fills the mines. Nickel from Indonesia and the Philippines where open-pit mining strips rainforest bare, and rare earths from China, which refines over 80% of the world's supply and controls export quotas like a geopolitical chokehold. So the industry began looking somewhere new, somewhere untouched, unclaimed, unseen. The seabed there holds metal deposits purer than anything mined on land. Each potato-sized nodule can contain up to 30% manganese and 1.3% nickel enough to power thousands of car batteries. The Clarion Clipperton Zone, or CCZ, stretches nearly 4.5 million square kilometers across the Pacific. It's a wasteland of darkness, pressure, and silence. But for corporations, it's a treasure map. In 2011, the first modern exploration contracts were granted. Today, the list includes China Ocean Mineral Resources Research and Development Association, the Metals Company, UK Seabed Resources, GSR, and Nauru Ocean Resources Incorporated, among others. Each one holds rights to vast exclusive plots, measured not in acres, but in oceanic provinces. Satellite maps show grids of claimed territory carved into the seafloor like real estate plots. Each block, a corporate frontier. Each license, a bet that the future of clean energy will be mined from the dark. But behind the promise of progress, a quieter game is being played. One that looks less like innovation and more like empire building. Because whoever owns the seabed controls the foundation of the next industrial revolution. Officially, no one owns the ocean. The International Seabed Authority, the ISA, was created in 1994 to prevent exactly that. Its mission, manage international waters for the benefit of all mankind. But the fine print created opportunity. 
The ISA allows sponsoring states to partner with private corporations. In practice, small Pacific nations like Nauru or Tonga sign the paperwork while billion-dollar firms supply the capital and equipment. The metals company, backed by Wall Street and billionaires, holds three such contracts through these alliances. UK Seabed Resources, once owned by Lockheed Martin, used Britain's flag to secure another. China's COMRA, directly state-run, controls some of the largest blocks of all. Each license lasts up to 15 years, renewable, and grants exclusive access to an undersea region rich in metals that could power entire nations. But there was never a public auction. No open bids, no transparent pricing. Just years of quiet negotiation in Kingston, Jamaica, where the ISA meets behind closed doors. Companies submit environmental studies. Nations sign sponsorships. And in exchange, they gain territory. Territory that can't be bought or sold outright, but can be leveraged for billions in future value. Leaked documents show how investors treat these licenses like securities. Private equity funds have bundled future seabed revenue into speculative portfolios. One analyst described it as the deep-sea equivalent of 19th century land grabs. A few delegates at the UN have begun pushing for a moratorium, warning that deep-sea mining could collapse ecosystems that haven't been discovered yet. But for the companies already holding licenses, delay equals opportunity. Because in the absence of regulation, exploration becomes ownership by default. The seabed may be international, but its profits aren't. Every argument for deep sea mining begins the same way. We need these minerals to save the planet. Electric cars, wind farms, solar grids all depend on cobalt, nickel, and rare earths. Without them, the transition to clean energy slows. But the question isn't whether the minerals are needed, it's how far we're willing to go to get them. Deep sea ecosystems evolve over millions of years, yet a single mining sweep can erase them in hours. Sediment plumes drifting for hundreds of miles and suffocating life far beyond the test zone. Crawler robots vacuum the seabed, separating nodules from sediment. The waste is pumped back into the ocean, spreading metal particles through layers that once filtered light and oxygen. Firms call this innovation. Scientists call it irreversible damage. Governments are split. Pacific nations like Nauru depend on mining fees for survival. Others, including Chile, France, and Germany, demand a global moratorium until more data exists. The US, not a member of the ISA, wants tighter regulations before joining the race is already funding through private proxies. To calm investors, companies promote new eco-friendly prototypes, electric bridges, closed sediment loops, real-time monitoring through satellites and blockchain. These are promising, but still unproven. Even the ISA admits the technology to mine sustainably does not yet exist. Meanwhile, demand keeps climbing. Every automaker wants supply independence. Every government wants green credibility. In this equation, morality has a deadline. The longer the world waits, the more valuable the seabed becomes. Access to the seabed isn't about science. It's about reach. Only a few nations have these ships, submersibles, and data to even attempt it. The United States funds deep ocean mapping through defense agencies and research grants. China operates more active research vessels in the Pacific than any other country. France, Japan, and Norway hold their own exploration programs, each backed by state money and corporate partners. Below that tier, small island nations act as proxies. They sign the paperwork while foreign investors supply the capital, machinery, and lawyers, a small cost for permanent leverage over a new frontier. Most of the data guiding these operations doesn't come from open research. It comes from decades of classified oceanographic studies conducted during the Cold War, mapping the same seabeds now being leased for mining. Those maps were once military secrets. Today, they're commercial blueprints. Inside the ISA's headquarters, only accredited delegates and corporate representatives are allowed. 
Environmental NGOs wait outside for 10-minute briefings that reveal almost nothing. Companies sit beside diplomats, quietly shaping the same rules they later obey. Minutes from closed sessions show mining firms proposing entire sections of regulatory text. Their language appears word for word in official drafts. When questioned, the ISA calls it consultation. Critics call it capture. Because the deeper you go, the fewer people can follow. And in the most literal sense, the only ones with access to the ocean floor are the ones who already own everything else above it. This isn't exploitation in the old sense. No gunboats, no colonies. It's bureaucracy turned into empire. Ownership hidden inside process. The table may be small, but the ocean beneath it is endless. The deep sea is the planet's last untouched frontier. Vast, silent, and mostly unmapped. Environmental studies warn that once disturbed, its balance shifts in ways we don't yet understand. The ISA's own reports admit that recovery timelines are unknown. No one can model what happens when an ecosystem that evolved in total darkness meets industrial machinery for the first time. Industry insists technology will evolve faster than the damage, promising cleaner dredges and real-time tracking. But even the most advanced prototypes leave scores visible from orbit. The paradox is brutal. The minerals needed for a green future may come from a process that permanently scores the planet's oldest environment. Because once the ocean floor is stripped, there's no reclamation, only memory. Follow the money and the ocean stops looking blue. A mining permit issued to a national contractor might trace back to a holding firm in London or Singapore. One step deeper, and you find pension funds, sovereign wealth groups, and private equity quietly financing equipment in exchange for future mineral rights. Most are invisible in public filings. The same laws that protect commercial secrecy now shield the first generation of ocean owners. Liability stays with the island nation. Profits move through tax-neutral jurisdictions like the Cayman Islands or Mauritius. No one violates the law because the law was written for land. And on the seafloor, ownership exists in a gray zone where property, sovereignty, and accountability overlap but never meet. Even the new transparency systems, satellites, blockchain ledgers, environmental audits depend on access to data that still belongs to the same few. Behind the maps and mission patches sits a simple arrangement. Scientists gather data, corporations extract value, and investors wait quietly in the middle. It's not theft, it's anticipation, buying control of a resource before the world realizes it's for sale. The surface story is exploration, the real story is enclosure, an ancient pattern repeating underwater. In late 2025, a new phase began. The Deep Sea Sampling 2 project launched with a promise to make mining cleaner, smarter, and reversible. The goal wasn't extraction, it was measurement. Engineers tested low impact dredges and real time ecological sensors designed to track every grain of disturbed sediment. Early findings confirmed what scientists feared. Even minimal contact leaves permanent disruption. Species vanish from test zones, and recovery models broke down when faced with life forms science hasn't fully named. The UN and the ISA now face an impossible equation. Halt development and lose momentum toward green energy independence, or proceed and risk erasing habitats before they're understood. Meanwhile, corporate filings show investors holding their ground. Capital hasn't fled, it's waiting for regulation to stabilize. The next wave of funding is tied to technologies branded as eco-mining. Drones, blockchains, verification, and satellite oversight. It's not ethics driving the pause, it's liability. The companies want the rules written before they resume digging. Even as the debate shifts towards sustainability, the demand never stops climbing. Every automaker wants independence. Every government wants progress without delay. And between those ambitions sits the ocean. Too deep to defend, too valuable to ignore. 
We've built a civilization that wants clean energy, but not the mess required to make it. When the land ran out, nations carved borders across continents. When oil peaked, they drilled the Arctic. Now, as the planet warms, the frontier has moved underwater. The ocean floor isn't a mystery anymore. It's the next market. Mapped, priced, and waiting. They didn't just buy the ocean. They bought the right to decide what the future is worth. We once said the ocean was too vast for ownership, too deep for profit. But every era redraws its boundaries. What began as curiosity became control. What began as science became stakeholding. And somewhere between the research vessel and the investor call, discovery lost its innocence. The same instinct that conquered land and privatized the skies has reached the abyss. The question isn't who wins, it's what disappears when they do. This is Bedlam Bear, where chaos has context and the future always comes with fine print.